Zainab alayhi salam's principles are principles which are to be observed by the males and the females of the community. Masha Allah, la hawla wa la quwwata illa billahi al-aliyy al-azim. Hasbunallahu wa ni'mal wakil, ni'mal mawla wa ni'mal nasir. Rabbi shrah li sadri. ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله وكفى وسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى محمد وأهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعسومين الذين أذهب الله عنهم الرجس وطهرهم تطهيرا اللهم صل على محمد واللعنة الدائمة الباقية على أعدائهم أجمعين أما بعد فقد قال الله تبارك وتعالى في كتابه المجيد بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وقال الحمد لله الذي صدقنا وعده وأورثنا الأرض نتبوأ من الجنة حيث نشاء فنعم أجر العاملين آمنا بالله صدق الله العلي العظيم اللهم صل على محمد Elders of the community my dear brothers and sisters in Islam and Iman assalamu alaykum jami'an wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Let me begin with uh, congratulating this very young boy here for a very beautiful speech and a beautiful message that he delivered the confidence and more on that uh, or on top of that the content that he gave was excellent in a very appropriate manner that he presented his speech subhanallah may allah azza wa jal reward him for his efforts insha'Allah and I would encourage like I said yesterday that the young boys who come to deliver these speeches make more efforts insha'Allah and move forward insha'Allah recite salawat please Allahumma salli ala Muhammad it is mentioned that when our fourth Imam Imam Ali Zainul Abidin Salawatullah wa salamuhu alayhi Allahumma salli ala Muhammad was given poison and as a result of that which he suffered a lot when the time of his death came near he asked to be laid at the place where he used to say his prayers at home. When he was laid there in the last moments of his life, he was reciting surahs of the Holy Quran and then he recited this verse of the Holy Quran. This is Surat Zumar, 39th Surah, verse number 74. It is the second last verse of Surah Zumar. I will read the meaning and uh, I will request you that when you go home, remember this. Surah Zumar 39, verse number 74, more easily the second last verse. Read the verse and then try to reflect upon it. Waqalu, and they will say, Alhamdulillahi alladhi sadaqana wa'dah. All praise belongs to Allah Azza wa Jal 
who has fulfilled his promise to us. Sadaqana wa'da has fulfilled his promise to us. Wa awrathana al-ard and he has made heirs to the earth. Ard over here according to Mufassirin is Ard of Jannah. Not the earth or not the earth in which we are living. Ard of Jannah. Okay. نَتَبَوَّأُ مِنَ الْجَنَّةِ حَيْثُ And that we may settle in paradise wherever we may wish. Reference to the Holy Quran you will find that even the Jannat or the paradise and it's not Jannat but Jannat has got different stages. Here Allah Azza wa Jal says, نَتَبَوَّأُ We allow them to settle at any place in the paradise that they wish. If you have been given this opportunity, which one would you choose? Naturally, the topmost. You want to call it Hilton, you want to call it Sheraton, whatever you want to call it. Okay. But we call it in Quran, Jannatu Adn. That Jannat which is the top most. And then the verse says, فَنِعْمَ أَجْرُ الْعَامِلِينَ How excellent is reward of the workers. Amil means worker. Amilin meaning the workers. How Excellent is the reward of the workers, and of course it is workers that is of the righteousness. Not every worker, but workers of righteousness. I have made this introduction, and I want to discuss about the life of our fourth Imam, after the event of Karbala. How many years did he live after Karbala? 34, 35 years, correct? It is 34 to 35 years of his imamat, of his leadership. What did he do? How did he fulfill his responsibility of imamat, of that leadership? Very important. I'm going to take you through history. But at the same time, I'm going to analyze and bring those things which are relevant at the present time. We need to understand that the lives of Aimma Tahirin salam are examples for us. So to begin with this evening, I want to try and explain to you what was the situation of the Muslim Ummah during the time of the Imamat of our fourth Imam. So let's begin with after the death of the Holy Prophet. Who went to the masjid to deliver a sermon? None other than the daughter of the Holy Prophet, Bibi Fatima Zahra alayha salam. In that sermon, which is very long, there are two sentences that she mentioned which have been historically proved up to today, up to today. She said, addressing the companions of the Holy Prophet, Addressing all those who were present in the masjid there. Remember she was behind a curtain when she was addressing. And she says in that khutbah. وَطَاعَتَنَا نِظَامًا لِلْمِلَّةِ And Allah Azza wa Jal has made obligation to obey us. وَطَاعَتَنَا And he has made this obligation to obey us. To set up order in the community. 
to set up order in the community. And after that she said, وَإِمَامَتَنَا أَمَانًا مِنَ الْفَرْقَةِ And has made our authority to, be, to save the people from differences. Ta'atana wa imamatana. Purpose of ta'atana or obedience to us, that there is order in the community. Imamatana is to stop the differences amongst us. I said at the beginning, historically it has been proved what she said was true and so far and up to now it is the situation. Now, Let's go to Hijra 40, the year when Imam Ali bin Abi Talib salawatullah wa salamuhu So we are talking about 30 years after the passing away of the Holy Prophet. What is period of 30 years? If you want to understand that and it make it very easy. I'm sure the young uh, professionals over here and the young people over here will understand this. But much more than is those of our age. We will understand it better. That after the WWW was introduced, right? So that digital way of communication, of working, Digital system was introduced 1992. After that we have seen ourselves as to how the workings and how the systems and how the conduct in the world has changed tremendously. 1992 up to 2018. You can see the big changes that have taken place. 30 years after the death of the Holy Prophet, our first Imam says this. He says, لم يبقى من الإسلام إلا اسمه ومن الدين إلا رسمه The Holy Prophet, Imam Ali al-Islam says, nothing remains from Islam except its name and from, in, from its religion except its custom. Look at the changes. Great changes that have taken place during those 30 years. That Islam, nothing remained, Imam said, except its name. And religion, nothing remained except its customs. Okay? Now, come to Hijri 61, 60, when Imam Hussein, salawatullah wa salamuhu alayhi, Leaving Medina, his wasiya to Muhammad Hanafiya, his brother, one of the sentences of that wasiya is, وَإِنَّمَا خَرَجْتُ لِطَلَبِ الْإِصْلَاحِ فِي أُمَّتِي جَدِّي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم The purpose of my leaving Medina is to bring about reformation in the Ummah of my grandfather. Okay? Imam is in Mecca. Yesterday, I told you that he met, or Abdullah bin Umar met with Imam. He tried to convince Imam to leave his stand instead of opposing Yazid, except or not to take this stand and just stay silent. At that time, Imam told one thing to Abdullah bin Umar. He said, أَمَا تَعْلَمْ أَنَّ بَنِي إِسْرَائِيلِ كَانُوا يَقْتُلُونَ مَا بَيْنَ تُلُوعِ الْفَجْرِ إِلَى تُلُوعِ الشَّمْسِ Sabina Nabiyan. Do you know? Imam is telling who? 
Abdullah bin Omar. Recite salawat, please. Do you know that Bani Israel, between the time of Fajr up to the time of sunrise, Nairobi, it is about one hour, ten minutes. Okay. The further you go north, the time span is larger. Okay. But just let us take average of one and a half hours. Between the time of Fajr and between the time of sunrise, they killed 70 prophets. After saying this, Imam now tells him, ثُمَّ يَجْلِسُونَ فِي أَسْوَاقِهِمْ يَبِيعُونَ وَيَشْتَرُونَ كَأَنْ لَمْ يَسْنَعُوا شَيْئًا Then they used to go to their shops, to their businesses, buying and selling in such a way as if nothing has happened. Imam was telling Abdullah bin Umar, O oh, Abdullah bin Umar, this is the state of the Ummah today. Halal and Haram going on. And the Ummah does not say anything. A person like Yazid becomes the ruler and the Ummah is silent. I'm trying to give you the situation of the Ummah of the Holy Prophet. How after the death of the Holy Prophet, until now 61 AH, this is the state of the Ummah of the Holy Prophet. Now, Imam did not only talk about the status of the Ummah of the Holy Prophet. Imam even talked about the status of the leadership of the Ummah. When Marwan came, this is second day, after Imam had gone to the house or to the palace of the governor of Medina, and Imam refused and told him very clearly, tomorrow when you ask the people of Medina, you will get my answer. And it is at that time that Marwan had told the governor of Medina that uh, force Hussein to give you answer just now, and if he cannot, then kill him. And it is at that time that Imam had raised his voice and the youths of Banu Hashim had come inside. And Imam left. The next day, Marwan meets with Imam Hussein Islam on the streets of Medina. And Marwan is trying to explain to Imam to leave that opposition, to leave his stand and to go forward except Yazid as the Khalifa. Imam told him at that time, Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'oon wa ala al-islami as-salam. But Imam did not stop there and he said, Ith bulliyatil ummatu bira'in mithla yazid, the world of Islam will disappear. As soon as Ummah is afflicted with a person like Yazid as its leader. So Imam is also now giving the status of the leadership of the Ummah. And if you want to really understand what was the situation of the Ummah, after the martyrdom of Imam Hussein al-Islam, listen to this. Because these words are coming from none other than Imam al-Sajjad, salawatullah wa salamu alayhi. Before we go to that, let's look at the leadership again. When the Asiran Karbala were brought to Damascus and when they entered into the palace of Yazid, remember that Yazid, 
himself did not give a speech, but he gave out or said some poetry. When he looked at the head of Imam Hussein al-Islam, what did he say? He said, لَعِبَتْ حَاشِمُ بِالْمُلْكِ وَلَا خَبَرٌ جَاءَ وَلَا وَحْيٌ نَزَلٌ He said that Banu Hashim played with the kingdom. No revelation came, no news came from Allah Azza wa Jal. If you had a leader who did not believe in prophethood, this was the status of Ummah. Let's go to what our fifth, fourth Imam said. Fourth Imam, this is repeated, uh, this has been narrated to us by Abu Umar Mahdi. He said that I heard the fourth Imam says, Ma bi Makkata wal Madinata ishreena rajulan yuhibbuna. After the martyrdom of Imam Hussein alayhi salam, he says that between Mecca and Medina, there were no more than 20 people who loved us. I was very much disturbed that during one of the majlises in Muharram, not here, Right? If I can say tens of thousands of majlises are held throughout the world. In one center, one of the person delivering the lectures had this audacity to say that the imamat of Ahlul Bayt salam, is not political leadership, it is only spiritual leadership. I'm pointing out those things that are so relevant today now. I want to tell my younger brothers and sisters that the madhab of Ahlul Bayt salam, you cannot be called a Shia Ithna Ashari if you do not believe in Imamat. If you do not believe in Imamat, you go and you are classified and grouped into like other Muslims. You are not follower of Ahlul Bayt. And this is where our fifth, fourth Imam says that you, could, you can count yourself or you can understand yourself that there were thousands of Muslims in Mecca, thousands of Muslims in Medina, and Imam says, in Mecca and Medina, all together, there were more, no more than 20 people who were our followers. I have laid this foundation to give you, to make you understand that this was the situation of the Muslims at that time. How difficult and how hard was the task of our fourth Imam. How did he complete these tasks? Look at the historians. And historians say, we give credit to the fifth and the sixth Imam that it is during their period that the Mazhab of Ahlul Bayt salam, spread. But the historians say that if you really want to look at how did this all come about, go to the time of our fourth Imam when he laid the foundation there as a result of which the fifth and the sixth Imam were able to continue with that work. Our discussion inshallah is going to be what were the difficult tasks that Imam faced and we are also going to discuss as to how Imam overcame all, through all these tasks. So it's not going to be one lecture, two lectures. Inshallah, it is going to be four lectures. At one particular place, I discuss this in ten majlises. One complete ashra about only Imam Ali Zainul Abidin al -Islam. But over here, I'm going to put it in concise manner, but deliver every point very shortly so that we are able to understand that those 35 years as people try to convey and say that Imam Ali Zainul Abidin al Islam spent in weeping for his father, yes, he was weeping, he was, there is no doubt about that. But that was not only his task. 
Imam had, let me tell you, he had political activity, he had cultural activities, he had social activities, he had economic activities during which he brought the Ummah of the Holy Prophet and made it very strong. This is interesting, inshallah. If you are not student of history, hopefully I will try to make it as interesting as possible. I'm not just going to come and give you stories, I'm going to analyze those stories. So we can understand that. But uh, we will continue, inshallah, today, tomorrow, Wednesday and Thursday, we will be discussing about our fourth Imam, inshallah, and we will see as to what work he did after the event of Karbala. Recite Salawat, please. So, when you look at uh, the imamat of our fourth imam, there is one Im most important difference between the imamat of fourth imam and the other imams. And that difference is that the rulers during the time, and there were not one or two, about seven to eight rulers during this period of 35 years, these rulers openly flouted the teachings of Islam, openly opposed the teachings of Islam. Example. You will be surprised. Example. Whenever the Banu Umayya Khulafa, you know their seat was Damascus. Headquarters was Damascus. Whenever they used to worry about and to have that control, they were worried more about Hijaz. Hijaz is what is the west of Saudi Arabia today, and that includes Mecca and Medina. They used to be afraid of that area. Why? Because they knew that there are pious companions of the Holy Prophet there. They knew that uh, the teachings of Islam would be spread from there. So they were worried that if we allow the people to settle there, allow the people to continue with their activities, then there will come a time when they are going to oppose us. There will be uprisings from there. So what should we do? Let's try and diverse or draw their attention away from them and keep them involved in such activities that they would not be able to focus on the teachings of Islam. So what to do? My younger brothers and sisters, listen. This is what the world is doing with the young people today. This is the policy that was used by the rulers at that time. Set up music and dance bars in Mecca and Medina. You will be surprised, historians have noted that prostitution was common in Mecca and Medina during that time. So that people would get involved, forget music, everyone is attracted towards it. Someone is, wants to get it, attracted, attracted to it and this is natural. It's not something which is unnatural, it is natural. Any person would be attracted towards a pleasant sound. Get them involved in this matter, they will forget about it and they will continue in those activities, pay little attention towards what is religion. Now forgive me please. Sometimes when we do not go towards something which is mustahab. I'm not saying wajib, mustahab. Our heart is not uh, attracted towards the kone time chair. Check it up. 
It may be result of a person sitting there and wasting his time in those activities which are considered to be vain, in which there is no benefit or usefulness for him. One of that is music. This is what they did, openly flout. During time of Abdul Malik bin Marwan, who was one of the rulers, during time of Imam Sajjad salam, he did not want the people of Damascus to go for Hajj to Mecca. Why? He was afraid if people go to Mecca there, then people of Damascus will hear something else, something different, different from the narrative that they are getting in Damascus. They may come to know the truth. So stop them from going from Hajj. But we can't tell them you can't go for Hajj. It is order in the Holy Quran. So he ordered that a sort of Kaaba should be built around Jerusalem. And he told the people of Damascus, go and perform your Hajj there. If you go and perform your Hajj there, it is equivalent to as if you have performed the Hajj of Kaaba. This is openly flouting, going against the orders of Quran, going against the orders of Allah. And in that time, Imam has returned, they have been freed, they are in Medina. There was a reaction in Medina. When people heard that Imam Hussein al-Islam has been martyred in Karbala, when people heard what had taken place to the captives of Karbala, there was a reaction. The governor of Medina at that time was a young person by the name of Uthman bin Muhammad bin Abi Sufyan. He thought and he said there is one way of coming out and that is to make up a delegation, send this delegation to Damascus, let them be guests of Yazid and Yazid will look after them, Yazid will treat them very well and when they return they will come and give favorable reports about Yazid and all this reaction will die down. So a delegation of people was made and the person who was given the leadership or one who became the leader, his name was Abdullah bin Hanzala. Abdullah bin Hanzala, who is Hanzala? Look at this. Hanzala is that person who got married just one day before the battle of Ohad. He got married. Now the Muslims had moved out of Medina because they were to face the enemies, the Quraysh, at the Mount of Ohad. He took permission from the Prophet and said, Ya Rasulullah, permit me, I go and spend the night with my newly wedded wife. And tomorrow morning I will come and I will participate. The Holy Prophet gave him permission. He spent the night with his wife. The next day he came. And in the battle of Ohad, he was martyred. Ulama have written about him that he is been given the title of Ghasilul Malaika because he was given ghusl by the angels. His son Abdullah is now one of those who is going there to Damascus. They go to Damascus. They stay there for around a week there. They are guests of Yazid. And when they were departing, Yazid give, gave each one of them either 50,000 or 100,000. I think he was looking at the status of each person and giving them either dinar or dirhams. Whether it is 50,000 or 100,000, it was a huge amount they were given. So when they return home, they will come home and then they will praise Yazid. When they returned there, Instead of praising Yazid, they started 
talking of the reality of what they saw. And they said, how can a person like Yazid be the ruler of the Muslims? There is no person who is more fasik, more fajr, one who transgresses everything, one who disobeys the command of Allah openly, more fasik than Yazid, one who drinks sharab openly, one who is spending his time only in, in, in enjoyment, enjoyment which is haram, and one whose past time or time past is playing with the monkeys. How can we make him to be the ruler of the Muslims? We depose him. We do not consider him now to be the ruler of the Muslims. As this message spread in Medina, the governor of Medina was thrown out. All the officers of Banu Umayyah were thrown out. There was a change here. Don't forget, Imam Ali Zainul Abidin al Islam is in Medina at that time, but leading a very quiet life. Why? Because these people, Abdullah bin Hanzala and the others, had given their oath of allegiance to Abdullah bin Zubair. I'm not going to go into it just now. We will talk about Abdullah bin Zubair because we will come to those discussions. But uh, Abdullah bin Zubair was not the right person. Imam kept quiet. Imam did not speak anything. Yazid sent a army by the name, by, under the command of a person by the name of Muslim bin Uqba. Later on, the history has named him as Musrif bin Uqba, and I will tell you why. He came, he studied the situation, surrounded Medina, or besieged Medina. When he put the people of Medina under pressure, now he enters, and there is killing, plundering, Massacre. My younger brothers and sisters, for three days, for three days, there was no Adhan in Masjid al Nabawi. For three days, that Masjid al Nabawi had been turned into a stable. There were horses there, there were uh, other animals there tied in Masjid al Nabawi. Three days. How many of the women were raped? How many of the companions of the Holy Prophet were killed? There were others who were taken as captives. When they were taken as captives, they were told, you are now slaves of Yazid. And they made a mark on the neck to say that you are slave of Yazid. This is called the event of Hirra, which is, which took place in the year 63 AH, Karbala 61. This event takes place in the year 63 AH in Madinatul Munawwara. And Imam Ali Zainul Abidin salam was safe. Muslim bin Uqba did not do anything to him. We will discuss this tomorrow. Why didn't he do anything to Imam? What was the conduct of Imam at that time? A great lesson in akhlaq that Imam Ali Zainul Abidin taught at that time. We will stop over here. Tomorrow we begin with what were the objectives of Imam and how did Imam meet these objectives. We will start discussing that tomorrow, inshallah. But remember this thing, that the life of Imam Ali Zainul Abidin salam, after the event of Karbala was a 
life that was full of activities because Imam Ali Zainul Abidin had to fulfill his responsibilities and duties as Imam. Recite salawat, please. Once again, please, recite salawat. Azadaran Imam Hussain al-Islam. Mujhe Imam Ali Zainul Abidin ki ek wasiyat yaad aati hai. Jab Imam bistare bimari par te aur unka وقت قریب آ گیا تو امام نے اپنے بیٹے امام محمد باقر علیہ السلام کو بلایا تھا اور امام محمد باقر علیہ السلام کو وسیعت کی تھی اور ان وسیعت میں ایک وسیعت یہ تھی اے بیٹا محمد میں نے یہ اونٹ پہ پچیس مرتبہ حج کیا ہے اور ان حج میں میں نے کبھی اس کو ایک مرتبہ بھی نہیں مارا ہے بیٹا اگر یہ اونٹ اس دنیا سے چلا جائے اگر اس کی موت ہو جائے تو اس کو کاٹنا نہیں اس کو دفن کرنا کیونکہ میں نے سنا ہے پیغمبر سے کہ کوئی بھی جانور اگر سات مرتبہ عرفات میں کھڑا ہو جائے تو اس کا مرتبہ ہی کچھ الگ ہے مولا آپ یہ ایک جانور کے لیے وسیعت کر رہے ہیں مولا آپ نے کیا دیکھا تھا مولا آپ نے کہا تھا کہ اس اونٹ کو نہ مارا جائے یہ جانور ہے میں نے اس پر سفر کیا ہے حج کا سفر کیا ہے ہائے مولا اگر آپ یہ جانور کی اتنی عظمت کرتے تھے ہائے وہ کیسے مسلمان تھے جنہوں نے پیغمبر کی اولاد پر کوئی حرمت نہ کی پیغمبر کی اولاد پر کوئی رحم نہ کیا آئے تاریخ گواہ ہے اور تاریخ پکار پکار کے کہتی ہے کہ جب اسیران کربلا کو کربلا سے کوفہ اور کوفہ سے شام لے جایا گیا تھا تو اس وقت اس وقت ان پر اگر کوئی بھی تھوڑی سی دیری ہو جائے یا کوئی کچھ ایسا دیر سے کھڑا ہو جائے ان پر تازیہ نہ مہرا جاتا تھا ازاداروں تاریخ کا ایک واقعہ ہے کہ جب یہ کافلہ جا رہا تھا تو ایک مرتبہ جو نیزے پہ امام حسین علیہ السلام کا سر تھا وہ ایک مرتبہ آگے نہ بڑھا زمین میں آ گیا اور ایک مرتبہ وہ شمر وہ ملعون جو امام کا نیزہ لے کے جا رہا تھا اس نے دیکھا بہت کوشش کی آگے نہیں بڑھتا شمر کے پاس گیا شمر کو کہا شمر آیا امام علی زین اللہ بدین کے پاس ازاداروں ایک مرتبہ آکے شمر نے امام کے پشت پر تازیا اور کہا جاؤ اپنے بابا کو سر کو کہو کہ آگے بڑھے اگر نہیں بڑھے گا تو تازیہ نہ لگیں گے ازاداروں جب امام جاتے ہیں اور امام کو پتا چلتا ہے کہ امام کی بیٹی سکینہ اونٹ سے گر گئی ہے 
आजाद हारो अब जो निकले हैं ढूंढने के लिए तारीख का वाक्य है देखा एक पर्दा पोष बीबी की बेटी है हाथ में सकीना है एक मरतबा जैनब ने कहा अरे खुदा आपको अजर दे आपने एक यतीमा की हिफाजत की है एक मरतबा आवाज आई जैनब मां को न पहचाना अरे मैं ही हूं जो अपनी पोती की हिफाजत कर उसे आलमीन वलमीबून इन्ना लाही राजन मातम हुसैन